Um, so however, I'm going to talk about how we're trying to take a strategic approach to using citizen science in the New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage. And I'll say at the outset that this talk is really about the work of Dr. Erin Roger, who's not paying attention at the back there, um, who you all know very well because she's the chair of the citizen Sci Australian Citizen Science Association. And we're pretty certain that Erin was the first um, official appointment in the government department as a citizen science scientist. So she's been leading our citizen science for um, several years now. And also Joe White, who's been very um, active in this conference as well, the director of science strategy. So they've cleverly managed up and got me to come and talk, but it's very much their work. Um, work. So OEH, as we refer to ourselves, we're the New South Wales Government Environment Agency. It includes national parks, management of threatened species, um, energy efficiency, sustainability programs, and also cultural and built heritage. So quite a wide remit. I'm the head of science, and we're very fortunate in OEH that science actually, we've got a quite a substantial science capability and I sit on the executive team alongside policy and programs and so on. So I think that's actually quite important because it means that science has got an equal status, if you like, in the governance of the department. And I'm pleased to say that's true in quite a lot of government environment departments. Um, our role is really, we do a lot of science internally, but our role is very much to partner with, with universities, private sector, government, and as I'm talking about today, to partner with community to really source and deliver the the best and the most relevant science to support OEH national parks and we also deliver science to the Environment Protection Authority in, in New South Wales um, as well as many other partners. So we have a citizen science strategy which Erin um, and Joe developed um, which is in its third year now and it's available on our website and I'd invite you all to go and have a look at it and I'm going to focus the talk really around um, how we've used this strategic approach. So our goal is to drive a new era of public participation in science to support OEH decision making. And if you go into, and I'd encourage you all to look at the strategy online, it's got um, it's nice pictures, not too much text, but it's quite clear about the goals and the actions that we're undertaking. Um, we've got a vision and an objective in there, and I'll note that I think I was quite influential at the time in um, getting in this factor that we really want it to be supporting decision making. So that's feeding into this common theme of really influencing policy and programs and we can engineer that to happen quite directly with our um, government programs. Also very important to engage the community um, and as I'll talk about shortly to meet particular standards. So in support of the strategy we also have a public position statement. We've got well, we've got three in total, but we use position statements to make kind of public statements that are signed off by our chief executive about the direction we're taking in a particular initiative. So again, you'd be able to find this online on the OEH website. And the element that I've blown up that I really want to pay attention to and to come back to is that our position statement includes a number of standards and principles that we try to apply to all of our citizen science projects to give it some structure. So. The first one is one that's been very widely discussed at this conference, and that is that we want it to be real science. We want the projects to meet science standards of scientific rigour. Um, we have a position statement around scientific rigour, and it's something we emphasise a lot in OEH, that we, all the science we do needs to be, meet the right standards. So the method needs to be peer-reviewed, it needs to be adhered to, and the results need to be peer-reviewed. So that's number one. That's really important. Um, Secondly, one that I think has been discussed a bit, but perhaps not so widely, it's citizen scientists are effectively volunteers for the department, and as such we have a real duty of care. They might, we might not be paying them, but we're still responsible for their safety. So we have good volunteer policy and procedures, and we actually need to follow that to do our risk assessments, make sure people are appropriately you know, using protective equipment and so on. Um, critical for us is that it adds value for OEH. So we have quite a, well, a very thorough process in OEH of not just identifying science that's relevant, but the science that's most relevant that we really need directly to support the programs we're rolling out, the policies we're developing. And we apply that and identify areas where citizen science can really contribute. And I'm going to just talk about a couple of examples later. And in fact, I'm going to be followed hotly on my heels by Gita Ortak, who will give a, a third example. And, and there have been several other talks from OEH scientists throughout this conference. 
Um, number four, we want it to be meeting community needs, be beneficial for the community. And the fifth, to really be making the best and most appropriate use of available technology. So we're making good progress. We have good public information about citizen science, a good entry point where people can see what projects are available and how to get involved. Um, and we've developed, we, Erin, <laughs> has developed a citizen science toolkit, which is meant primarily for internal staff to really guide them through setting up citizen science projects, but is all available on the website as well to, for anybody externally to access and use. So making good progress and getting the framework and tools available. Um, and the next big challenge that we're very actively talking about at the moment actually is the, the one that again has been a very recurrent theme, which is the one of data. So an observation is there's great innovation in all these citizen science projects. There's many different apps, but I've heard a number of people saying there are all these apps, you know, how do we actually bring them together? Where is the data going? Is it going to different places? So in New South Wales, we're formulating the idea of developing an OEH citizen science hub, which would be able to um, harvest all of the different citizen science data, be a place where citizen scientists could get feedback, could interact, and really bring all this together in one place. Um, we've also had the question raised about the long-term storage of this data. And what we would do is once we've applied the appropriate quality assurance, which has again been referred to in many of the talks, data that meets the, the, that quality actually goes into our corporate databases. So the one here is Bionet, which is our biodiversity database. We have other ones for soils, um, air, a whole range of them. So we'd actually bring the data into those databases, in which case they're going to be looked after, the data will be there roughly in perpetuity, or as long as the government keeps funding. And finally, we've got another, um, we have a big emphasis on open data, open innovation. And we have an environmental data portal now that's also live in, in New South Wales. Its acronym is SEED, which stands for Sharing and en Enabling Environmental Data. And what that does is enables people just to log on and with no special software actually combine different spatial data sets. So you, the idea would be to be able to combine a spatial data set from citizen science once they're available there with the location of national parks, there's the location of coal sink gas exploration, there's air quality data, other biodiversity data. So you can actually ask questions by combining quite disparate data sets. And we're really trying to grow the number of data sets that are available there. So this is our sort of grand plan for managing the data. Um, but we acknowledge that remains one of the big challenges. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples on how we've used the strategy and our criteria in that. So this is a project that we're delivering for the Environment Protection Authority. Um, in New South Wales introduced a, coast, uh, coast, a container deposit scheme which started on December 1st last year. So it's going pretty well. There's over 71 million um, containers already um, recycled through that scheme since the beginning of December. I'll, I'll acknowledge this is all a bit comical probably to those of you who are from South Australia because the scheme has been going for 40 years here I think. But um, Nevertheless New South Wales has introduced one. And it's very important and a real opportunity to actually be able to monitor the impact of this on litter. So we have a coastal environment monitoring program which involves a major citizen science component and that's trying to monitor the, the change from before this container deposit scheme was introduced to afterwards. So we've got 150 citizen scientists involved, a number of groups. Um, and you'll note that we're, we're working with these different groups and also working with EPA Victoria and group in, I think, a university in Queensland. So I'm sorry to say that those that um, Victoria and Queensland are our control groups because they do not have container deposit legislation at the moment. So uh, we'll be able to monitor changes not only with respect to what New South Wales looked like at the outset, but also compared to other jurisdictions that don't have this yet. So the initial results from the baseline survey is in. Um, the different sites have been monitoring up to between 8 and 40 percent of the litter was containers. And we're, we'll be starting that post-implementation monitoring shortly. And that will feed very much back into the evaluation of the effectiveness of this waste and management program and therefore help inform future ones for the Environment Protection Authority. Now my second example comes from um, the Saving Our Species program, which is a threatened species um, recovery program that we're running in New South Wales, for which we got quite a good amount of additional funding at the last election. Um, this particular project, and Gita will talk about another one in this, under the Saving Our Species, but this one is about this, the spotted tail quoll, which is a vulnerable species. 
in New South Wales. Um, it's a, a one that moves quite freely in the landscape, so harder to know what the population status is. So we've been using um, remote camera traps to, to monitor that. And again, through the digital Digi Digivol platform, which again has been referred to extensively, using citizen scientists to actually interpret those images and, um, and um, you know, give us feedback on those data, data things. Now, I've just realized that I forgot to step through my bits of the science strategy with the container deposit scheme. But with this one, we've, you know, we're addressing the um, data quality and the scientific rigor through um, feedback, I guess, on the analysis of those images. So we're getting a lot of good feedback and seeing how we can improve that interpretation. Um, I think the one about the duty of care is quite an interesting one. I've been reflecting on the last couple of days because this is people sitting at home on their computers. So there's not, no major duty of care. But, it, you know, it's just something that I leave out there that the more we encourage people to sit behind computers, that's raising other issues at the moment around um, health. So one to think about. Um, clearly of major relevance to OEH, um, you know, com community very engaged and um, I'm just trying to think of my last thing, and very good use of technology. So again, it meets all those standards. And I should say, just going back briefly to the container deposit scheme, we did have a very significant statistical review before we embarked on that, and I know that changed quite significantly the way the transects were done and the way the litter was actually surveyed on beaches. So to sum up, um, I think we're doing quite well in OEH. We've got the strategy in place, and that's very useful in guiding how we develop citizen science projects and really gives us some structure around the program. Uh, we've got very strong ministerial and executive support, so the... The uh, guy in the lilac shirt here is our current chief executive who is out, in fact, on the project that Geeta's about to talk about, and very enthusiastic. We've got a good range of projects, so you can see on the website and the variety of talks we've had here. And we're applying our standards of rigour and volunteer policies, and I think we're getting some structure. Um, the opportunities really are that securing and managing the data, actually being able to provide feedback to the citizen scientists who are contributing their time. You know, how do we really close the loop and say how that's contributed to managing the qual or to, you know, EPA's policies around litter management? And then the last one that I'll also put out there is how do we evaluate success? So there's many different ways you could evaluate success. Um, when I was first talking to our minister about this and introducing her to the concept, you know, she asked some very penetrating questions about how much support do we have to put in for citizen science? You know, is it, is it good value for money or do we end up having to spend a lot of resources for, you know, not getting such great data back? And I think we, you know, we're all, in this room, we're all very convinced of the power of citizen science, but it'd be really, we really need to actually ask those questions and get some good Australian case studies. I think there's some terrific ones from overseas, but not so much from... Australia, and that'll be really valuable to help us build the case um, to actually embed this much more deeply in government decision making. I made my 15 minutes. <laughs>